President Cross was in the dodecahedron once more, and with the way things were shaping up, he'd be spending a lot of time in the military command centre. This was why they built the rest of the dodecahedron under the old pentagon. From the outside it looked the same, but now they had a hell of a lot more space underground. The old joke had been that Washington was an iceberg, with only a fraction of the city being above ground. Now it was especially true. Besides the dodecahedron, there was the White House 2.0, Basement Congress, the Smithsonian Emergency Patriotic Museum, and the Nixon Presidential Monument. He'd had it constructed in secret back in the 1970s. Every time a president ordered it taken apart, the workers would start dying in very mysterious circumstances, and eventually everyone figured it was easier to just leave Nixon's ghost alone. It had been ages since the president had to worry about a full-scale war. They just dealt with small border skirmishes, where they send out a carrier group and bomb deep Xeno systems to get them to bugger off. In general, there weren't too many disputes anymore. Humans liked high-gravity planets, and did just fine on death worlds. That and they fought far more ferociously than any other intelligent species. Cross smiled as he thought about the time the Furlong Consortium tried to conquer an outline mineral-rich system. They'd used their smaller destroyers and cruisers to screen the system, while two dreadnoughts and a few support ships were left to seize the orbital factories in the system's asteroid belt. What had happened were the workers, armed with nothing more than welding torches and mining tools, jumped from their asteroids to swarm over the hulls of the ships. The Furlong Admiral has sent a panicked message screaming about humans swarming the hull, before the bridge was cracked and he got sucked out into space with his command staff. By the time the screening fleet pulled back to try and deal with the workers, they found that the humans had secured the Dreadnought's guns to asteroids as makeshift orbital platforms. The rest of the fleet simply surrendered. The American Navy didn't even have time to respond before the war had started and finished in a day. Most of the time, the best deterrent against Xeno incursion was the average American. They carried guns, lived on shitty planets, and if told that someone wanted to take their shitty land, they'd fight tooth and nail over it. Of course, once Americans had settled a planet enough to make it comfy, and pet psychiatrists became a profession, and there were cookie-cutter coffee shops everywhere, they'd pack up and move on to the next shitty planet, where they could be rednecks in peace. The first thing any American colonist on a new planet did was create the largest, most ridiculous vehicle to get around comfortably on the planet. Rock buggies, super swamp sliders, masher monster trucks, Cross's favourite were the lava gliders from Texas too, sometimes referred to as Satan's asshole. Indeed, there was very little overlap between human colonies and Xenos who wanted to steal them. It was mostly about mineral systems and FTL junctions, which was why no one had fought humans on the ground yet. It seemed like that was all going to change, however, as the president listened to the tail end of another intel report. So, these spacecrafts are really going ahead with this? The intel officer nodded. Yes, yeah, sir. We continue to intercept fleet orders and transmissions to their commandos to start raiding and capturing humans. As far as we can tell, they're going to try and hold Civis hostage and get that trucker to surrender the diplomat. Have they even asked us our stance of the whole situation? No. President Cross snorted at that. All this time, all the galactic government ever did was tell us to not wipe anyone else out and keep our war small. Now their secret police assholes are ready to kidnap colonists and hold them hostage because of the actions of one American? Director Ripper gave President Cross the heebie-jeebies, especially since he was in charge of the CIA. He had those super blue eyes that looked dead somehow, and always reminded the president of one of those bad guys in movies, who would cook up body parts and toss them in a salad. Even so, he was one of the best directors Cross had ever seen, and despite never wanting to go fishing with the guy, the president trusted his judgement. So when he spoke, Cross listened. As you know, human construction crews have been awarded all FTL gate and FTL convoy contracts in near space, we haven't had a chance to work on the core systems, but we're confident that everything around us is taken care of. 
Yeah, so we've got all of their communications, but what's the deal with the gates? Theoretically, we could reverse the flow of the gates and crush everything traveling on the FTL lanes at that moment. But we're really not sure how well that would work out. Plus, it's not specific. We crush everything, civilian or military. Cross nodded at that. Alright, well as soon as we confirm reports of the space crab attacks, start bombing the shit out of their core systems. If it's possible to just shut down the FTL gates and strand their fleet, we should try it. If it looks like we'd be hitting a lot of civvy traffic and stranding them as well, then forget it. How bad is this going to be? This is their secret police, after all. Ripper nodded at that. Yes, but that's their folly. They used a small commando race against pirates and specific threats. They haven't engaged in wholesale war since their conflict with our new allies. Yeah, speaking of that, weren't they waiting to hear about the success of their diplomat and our space trucker? For the ceremony, yes, but they're forging ahead with the actual mechanics of our new alliance. What are we looking at for blowback? Total war with the rest of the galaxy. The room got quiet as the assembled officers, congress people, experts, and of course, Governor Dundee, stared at the CIA director. It's against the treaty they were forced to sign at the end of the war I mentioned. Forming an alliance with them basically restarts it. And they're not nearly as strong now as they were when that war started. The few allies they had abandoned them during the fighting. And while they still have a formidable intel service and commandos, they've got virtually no ground troops or navy. Cross rubbed his chin. Will the rest of the galaxy attack the UHG too? That's unclear at this point. We're very explicitly stating this as an alliance between America and the Libertonians, not the USG, but the spacecrafts are targeting their colonies already. Yeah, but all American colonies are unofficial. That's the point. We give the USG the good planets and let them do things by the book. We take the shithole so no one bothers us. Until we fix them up enough for the USG to move in, that is. The spacecrafts likely don't know we've got people out there. They're just attacking what they know is human. He sighed and shook his head. Try and make it extra clear this is Americans, not normal humans. See if we can spare the rest. Otherwise, mobilize everything. Call up all our reserves. America is gonna war. The rest of the room was nodding in agreement. They'd be ready for the official declaration. Sir? One of the admirals spoke up. We've got a carrier group poised to hit the crabs at home. It's tradition for the President to name the First Strike Operation. President Cross smiled. There was only one option. We're gonna call it Operation Billy Bob Space Trucker. Emily groaned as she sat on the crate Billy Bob had set up for her next to the ship. The weight of this planet was intense for her, even though she knew it wasn't even normal for Billy Bob. After escaping with the trophy, they'd taken off and driven through two of her sleep cycles before he had pulled out of the FTL lane to land on an uninhabited planet. He wanted to give their new pet a chance to stretch his legs. The problem for her was how heavy the gravity was. She had insisted on joining him outside in the blue light of the planet's sun. The light gave everything an odd tint, but most of the planes and foliage looked green to her. She was resting on a crate, since just breathing was a bit of a strain for her. Billy Bob was tossing that large fake bone in the air, and Stomper, the name he'd chosen for it, would chase it down, pick it up and run it back. Then it would stomp around in front of him, hence the name, until he wrestled it down and took the toy back before throwing it again. She couldn't believe the confidence he showed with the animal. His body language was perfect for maintaining control over the creature, was he trained in it? Or was this another strangely innate ability humans seem to possess? Most species had considerable difficulty domesticating creatures. Maybe it had to do with being omnivores. She was aware they had some sort of species of meat animal that was so docile they could just walk them into a house of slaughter. Which, if her translator was correct, was a rather awful name, even if it was descriptive. He had also informed her that the creature's leavings were rainbow-coloured, which gave him no shortage of amusement. 
He'd insist that she come take a look, but even if the gravity wasn't so intense, she'd have skipped out on the offer. It seemed like Stomper had been happy with the toys and bed they brought for him. Well, that she had bought for him upon Billy Bob's begging. She had no idea what they'd do when it was fully grown, however. Then she blinked a little at the thought. She was only supposed to be with Billy Bob for another few standard galactic weeks. There wasn't nearly enough time for Stomper to grow significantly. The diplomat blinked slowly in the heavy gravity as she thought about that. They'd only been travelling for around a standard galactic week, and she was already thinking as if they were going to be travelling together for years, not just weeks. Besides, not being sure how Billy Bob felt, she wasn't even all that sure they survived more than a few weeks. By now, the Crustacans had to be aware that she had a copy of their suppression device, and planned on unveiling it to the council meeting. They hadn't been able to track Billy Bob, it seemed, but that was likely because he was refueling at black market stations now, and slept next to the FTL lanes in deep space, instead of any sane species who'd stop in a habited system. They might be set upon by Crustacan hunter killers at any moment. Even if he'd taken out that first squad with surprising ease, they hadn't been expecting resistance. Still, she couldn't believe how lucky she was to have met him at that moment. Maybe she'd have him take a few detours on their way to the capital. She'd first been worried about making it in time, but with the way he drove, speed wasn't a problem. Her handlers had messaged her through the convoys to let her know the Crustacans might be moving against the Americans. She didn't know if she should tell Billy Bob or not. It wasn't like he could stop them from attacking his people. Would he want to know? She was wracked with guilt and worry about what she was getting him mixed up in. As she watched him toss the toy to stomp her, she wondered what was going through his head. This is fucking awesome! It's a six-legged space fox that's going to become as big as a horse! That he could ride! He was excited. And of course, as he played fetch with Stomper, all he could think about was how awesome it would be to ride around a space fox. He still hadn't figured out a satisfying name for the species, but he didn't give a shit about that anymore. He would grab Stomper's tail and wag it around, and then Stomper would stomp around with his tongue hanging out, head in the air. The thing even purred. He had a purring space fox. Fucking awesome. And it shat rainbows. Well, rainbow coloured turds. But that was hilarious. He had to tell Ted. And probably Ivan. And while he was at it, he should tell Paco Taco too. They get the word out. The only problem was he was the only trucker this far into Xeno space. He had the deepest 99 of all. He didn't think any humans had even made it this far let alone all the way into the capital. He was having fun with Stomper, but when he looked over and saw Emily lounging out on the crate, he realised he should pack it up. So he chucked the bone as hard as he could and let Stomper really chase after it, before walking over to the back of the ship. When the space fox returned, he smiled and wrestled around with it for a moment, before leading it up into the back of his ship. He made sure Stomper had water, and he'd cooked some of the meat up, mashing it to make sure his new pet didn't have any troubles with it, before walking back out and closing the cargo ramp behind him. He walked back up along his ship to Emily, who was trying to push herself up from her lounge position on the crate, but struggling to do that. This... gravity... she gasped out. Billy Bob just smiled and reached down, picking her up off the crate. She was heavier than when they tangoed, but he could still manage it just fine. He had to be careful to cradle her under her knees and along her upper back, so he didn't put too much pressure on her wings. He didn't mind. After all, she was being a good sport about letting him play with Stomper. Once he was back through the airlock, and the gravity returned to standard for her, she didn't leave his hold just yet. I'm, uh, still kind of sore. Mind setting me on the bed? She asked, and he shrugged, obviously not minding carrying her a little further. She looked up at him, a flood of various emotions washing over her before she leaned up, nursing her pointed beak like muzzle under his beard and giving a nip. What she couldn't see due to his beard was the vein just beneath it. His eyes went wide and she frowned as she tasted something awfully metallic 
before Red began to pour down his throat. She leaned back in his arms before he gasped, dropping her as he collapsed to his knees, clutching his throat as Red began to seek for his fingers. She gasped out, wide-eyed as she jumped up. Oh shit! Oh merciful deity! What did I do? Billy Bob? He just gurgled a little as he clutched the hole and she ran around in a panic. What did I do? How do I fix it? Mittens was sitting up on the bed, looking between them as the cat wondered what the commotion was about. She remembered the biogel, and quickly yanked open the cupboard he put the bottles in. She frantically ran back, kneeling next to him while unfastening the top. She was so nervous the purple gel spilled out a bit onto his side, as she poured more out, rubbing it on and around the hand he had clutching his throat. Then she poured out more into the cap, which she shoved to his mouth. He opened his lips a bit to try and force the liquid down, before his breathing began to return to normal. She sat next to him looking worried and nervous, until he suddenly pulled his hand from his throat. His hand had quite a bit of red along it, as did his throat and the top of his shirt. He gasped a little, and stayed on his knees for a moment as Emily stared at him wide-eyed. Then he looked over at her. What the fuck? I'm sorry. I'm super really sorry. I didn't mean for that to happen. I had no idea it would. You, you always seem so tough. It... It's... He was looking down at his hand for a moment, and then back up at her. She could see the confusion in his face. It's how my people show affection. By trying to rip out their karate artery? She frowned at that. Your martial arts artery? No, fuck. Karate? Whatever. The thing that guides the blood to my brain. I fucking need that. I'm sorry. My people's anatomy is different. Oh, really? The completely different species has critical life need in stuff? In other places? Jesus. He rubbed his hand along his throat again and shakily stood up, wobbling a bit before walking into the bathroom. She sat on the floor still, trying to calm down, still, and remembering to reseal the biogel bottle. She heard him scrubbing his hands with some sort of cleaner. The hell was that about, Emily? I take it from your reaction you weren't actually trying to kill me. No, I'm really sorry. It was just, you were carrying me, and I felt comfortable, and, and I just felt... I don't know. I wanted to show some affection. By ripping my throat out? That's not what I thought would happen. I was caught up in a moment. I'm sorry. You don't seem that distraught. You aren't even crying. He stepped out of the bathroom, rubbing his hands hard with a cleaning gel while she looked up at him, and he noticed the moisture in her eyes and along her cheeks. She just wasn't sobbing like a human might. Shit. Never mind. I... Fuck, you obviously didn't want it to happen, so apology accepted. It's just... Stressful trying to hold my blood in so I don't fucking die. He shook his head for a moment as she looked down and away from him. He sighed out and turned back to the bathroom, finally turning on the water to wash off the last of the cleaning gel, now that his hands were clean. For many people, that part of the neck is rather leathery under our feathers. We show affection by nipping at it when the other person has it exposed to us. I exposed it to you? Well, you were carrying me in your arms, and I... I didn't think it through. I'm really sorry, Billy Bob. We had that dance, and... She got quiet as he dried his hands off. Looking over at her for a minute, he didn't seem to know what to do. So he didn't say anything as he walked back out of the ship picking up the crate he'd set out for her earlier, and stowing it away in the cargo bay, giving Stomper another pet as he walked through. Then he opened the door to his cabin. She had put the biogel away, and was sitting in the co-pilot's chair, seeming closed in, and trying to take up very little space. He still wasn't totally sure what to say, so he climbed into the pilot's chair, starting up his longhorn to let it warm up before takeoff. They were quiet as he took them back up into space, heading to the nearest FTL lane to get going again. He finally broke the silence. So, that's affection, huh? Billy Bob? Hey, it's okay, I survived. 
It was just a little cut. I probably overreacted. It was just... unexpected. I'm really sorry. I got that. It was just a mistake. A little misunderstanding between two different species. It's okay. Since I didn't actually die. She still looked a little worried. And obviously regretful she'd hurt him like that. For his own part, he wasn't sure what sort of affection she was talking about. Like, affection affection? He saved that question though, not sure if he was ready to tackle it. So, you like that dance, huh? The tango? I didn't think about it too much, I was focused on winning. Were you? It just seemed so intimate. I thought, well... She trailed off. Maybe you could teach me how to dance sometime? Yeah, that's no problem. I'll need you to get some practice if we hope to really win next time. Your form is a bit sloppy and you stare at your feet way too much. You need to be more aware of your body. She stared at him as he glanced over. Hey, is the truth. I meant dancing for fun. Fun? Listen, Emily, let me tell you what my dad told me just before my first Little League baseball game. It's not about trying your hardest. What matters is if you win. Your father did not tell you that. I'm not kidding. After we lost the game over, which I had no real control, because I was, like, young, we stood out in the parking lot and he pointed to the other kids getting into vehicles with their family. He told me, all these other kids are going to get peace with their families to either lessen the sting of defeat or make victory all the more sweet. And do you know where we're going, Billy Bob? And I asked if we were going to get pizza, and he said, no, we're going home and eating what your mother feels like making with as little prep as possible. And that's just what we did. Emily was staring at Billy Bob, open mouthed with shock. That, that was your father? Billy Bob nodded. So you know what happened in the next Little League game? I told my team if we lost, I was going to start kicking them in the balls. Even if they had cups on to protect it, it still hurts. And you know what? We won. And my dad told me he was extremely proud of me. So, I kind of have a thing about winning. If I can't win by the rules of the game everyone else is playing, I have to change the rules and win my own game. But you have fun constantly. You're the most insane, fun-loving creature I've ever met. Yeah, because that's the game I play most of the time. That's part of why I became a space trucker. The only real rules I had to follow were delivering shit to the right place at the right time. I kick ass at that. Which leaves me free to just have fun doing whatever the fuck I want. But when I'm dancing, that's a competition, and I gotta win. So, if you want me to teach you to dance, I can. And I'll try not to get into my competitive mindset. But, no promises. She thought it over for a moment. Alright. I'll take whatever teaching you're willing to give. But no more neck biting. No more neck biting. I said I was sorry. I know, and I'm okay. So long as we're clear, don't try to kill me again. He smiled as she began to realize this was just his behavior. Well, not by biting your neck. Your blood tastes awful. Oh, does it? Well, that's good to know. In case we're ever in a fight, I'll try to bleed into your mouth. I'm sure that's a good strategy. She giggled a little, finally starting to relax a bit now that she realized Billy Bob was really okay. Yeah, try that on a flying predator. I'm sure you'll do well. Yeah, I'm not too worried about that, bird brain. Bird brain? What's that supposed to mean? Nothing. Let's get some music going. He turned his music back on as they shifted into the FTO lane, flying on towards the capital. And so ends another chapter in the adventures of Billy Bob, Space Trucker.